Good morning. Um, my name is Bruno. Uh, it's kind of weird here. It look, feels like three different classes. Uh, <laughs> with a, you know, I, I don't know where to look. <laughs> so they're so wide apart. The, the, the two. Well, I think I'll get used uh, as we go. Um, good morning. It's nice to to be here to try to to talk to you about Brazilian politics. It's not an an easy matter at this point. We are trying to figure out ourselves what's going on, and it's not. It's kind of a the political system at this point is pretty much adrift, and we still don't have. It's not clear at all where we are going to be some five or ten years from now. But, and we are still trying to catch up uh, where we are in some place between the optimism of some ten years ago and the strong pessimism of this point. Uh, it's not easy to figure out where you know, the, a kind of a, a, a clear-sighted point of view that could somehow serve to a diagnosis about Brazilian politics at this point. So, uh, I'll try my way here uh, in between those, uh, <laughs> which I, I hope not to get completely lost. Uh, so, I'm a professor here at the UFMG at the Political Science Department, and I happen to to serve as as the director of dean of the Faculty of Philosophy and Humanities here at this point. And let's go here. Here, well, it's as you can tell, it's hard to to decide where to catch up with Brazilian politics at this point. And I'm trying to, to, to see, a, to choose for a, a first step. I opt for the party system. Um, kind of, as you know, we are, we are all pretty much familiar with uh, American politics somehow. So Brazil, Brazilian cases in many aspects uh, has has adopted different solutions for similar problems to the American case. And we can, in a, in a first characteristic, there are clearly the opposites. The American case is a, the strongest duopoly of parties in democratic countries with 150 years of the same two parties uh, in a kind of a, you know, they are not simply defiable in those places. They, they have, they, the two parties together, Democrats and Republicans, share a kind of monopoly of party politics in the United States. In Brazil, we are at the other extreme. We, we, at this point, we have 30 parties at the lower chamber, at the Câmara de Deputados. Uh, it's the national and global record for this indicator. And why is that? You know, I will make, make this mistake. You know, we can look to many things when we look to parties, and we can look to history and culture, but we are going to focus here in institutions. And electoral rules are clearly important, and they are more manipulable than the other aspects. You can, it's hard to change electoral system, but once you do, and the, the next elections may proceed by completely different rules. And this has immediate effects in, in party dynamics. You have in the case of the United States, you have single-member districts. Each district elects one representative. 
And so, all else being equal, this kind of decreased the number of parties, because you only have seats if you are the winner in a district. And proportional representation, all else being equal, increases the number of parties, as if you have 10 seats in a district, a party wins a, dis uh, a seat if it manages to have 10% of the vote. So you're going all less being equal. This kind of is called the Duverger law. It's, you know, proportional representation increase the numbers of party. Single member districts decrease the number of parties. Well, in the case of of Brazil, we'll see in a minute. You have an extremely um, an, an extreme case of proportional representation. Since you have uh, large districts, you have some districts with, you know, the state of Minas Gerais uh, elects 50, 53 representatives in the lower chamber in, in Brazil. So every party that managed to have, say, 2% of the vote elects a federal deputy in Brasilia to represent Minas Gerais. So, it, it allows a lot of party inside of the system. So you have huge districts with tens of seats. So you have an electoral uh, threshold that's very low, and then you have lots of parties. So this is pretty much mathematical. You know, there's a lot of, you know, theoretical reasoning about the political effects of multi-party systems, but it's not necessarily unstable in itself. But Brazil, uh, you know, they, you may have, you know, uh, half a dozen of relevant parties in a chamber. It's not a problem. Uh, not even if none of them um, has a majority, and they may manage to hold coalitions. So, and. Typically, European political systems have multi-parties, multiple parties with a dozen of parties or so, and then you manage to, to govern. And, but traditionally, people used to think that presidentialism was not uh, a good match for multi-partyism because of, in presidentialism, the, the, the the mandate of the government, it's not tied to a parliamentary majority, so you have a president that's going to govern anywhere, anyway, uh, and um, it not necessarily would have to manage a majoritarian coalition. This could be destabilizing. This was the thesis about some kind of literature that I used to call the Old Testament, can be illustrated by a nice piece of work by Scott Mainwaring in 1993 that argues is at exactly this point, that multi-party presidentialism uh, doesn't use to work. Let me see. Uh, besides theoretical reasons, had a lot of very good empirical evidence to be cautious about multi-party presidential regimes. 30 of uh, 31 democracies with more than a quarter of century then, in 1993. So 31 countries that were democratic since 1968. Uh, only four presidential regimes, none of them with multi-party systems. And only one historical precedent, the case of Chile by the mid 20th century, that ended up with the coup by Pinochet. And that was an extremely bloody uh, coup with the suicidal of the president agenda and uh, kind of the paroxysmally violent military dictatorship of Latin America in the 70s. So it shouldn't work in principle. Since then, until the middle of this decade, Brazilian political science used to explain, well, it can work. And it was working in Brazil. So. Uh, we were kind of uh, uh, an exception to the, the old conventional wisdom. And Brazilian political scientists used to publish abroad 
uh, about the virtues of coalitional presidentialism. That's kind of a catchword about our, our system. But a lots of multi-party presidential regimes actually emerged in Eastern Europe, various African countries, and Latin America with the, you know, the classic case, Brazil. Well, a kind of a historical synopsis of Brazilian history. Uh, we have this table here that I arranged for this purpose, and you can catch our institutional sequence in a glimpse. This is the idea. I have an 1822, some 50 years after American independence, you have Brazilian independence. It's kind of a, a, a very peculiar independence process that it was preceded by a move by the royal family in Portugal to Brazil, to Rio, and it was the only case in America where it happened. It's as if you think like the, the, the King of England, the, the British King that would move to Massachusetts and somehow govern the, the Great Britain from the America. That was the case in Brazil between 1808 and 1820, uh, as the King of Portugal fled from, fled, sailed <laughs> from Portugal, assailed by Napoleon troops, and it governed Portugal from Rio uh, for some 10 years, 12 years actually. And since 1815, Brazil was not a, anymore a colony, but a United Kingdom of Brazil, Portugal, and Algarves, that is the southern region of Portugal. So it was kind of, you know, the capital of the United Kingdom was not Lis Lisbon anymore, but it was Rio de Janeiro. So it kind of uh, a, a very peculiar situation where, you know, then you had a revolution, not in Brazil, but in Portugal, at the city of Oporto. And then the revolutionary courts decided to call the king back. And the king went away in 1820 and uh, let his son and the heir of the throne back in Brazil in 1822, for any case. Uh, as you had the, the French Revolution just a couple of decades before, then you had good reasons to be cautious about what you do at that time. And then you had so you had the 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 heir of the throne, the 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 the, the prince regent of Brazil, the Portuguese heir that was uh, governing Brazil, and in a couple of years between the departure of the king and the independence of Brazil, there was a revolution going on in Portugal, and then kind of a bureaucratic elite that surrounded the, the Prince Pedro in Brazil that was prone to, well, well, let's cut those ties with Portugal and let's take care of our own business because, you know, Portugal is unpredictable at this point. So it's a very peculiar uh, independence process that uh, make way, made way to, to an independence history with a an American monarchy, uh, the only case of a monarchy in Americas, uh, for 77 years, 67 years, from 1822 to 1889, with a, based on uh, slave labor. And you know, it's very significant that you, have, you had the slavery until 1888, we are always a few decades uh, behind things that are going on in the, the process in the United States. And then you had the independence in, in the, the American case in 70, in kind of late 18th century. Then you have in the early 19th century the independence process in South America. And here in Brazil with a kind of a 
uh, slavist empire that used to be called by our neighbors. And then it's very significant that you have slavery abolition in 1888 and then the fall of the empire in 1889. It's not a kind of a lots of uh, a, good, a good piece of land owners and slave owners, you know, alienated support from the monarchy to republic. Shift the giants just as uh, the abolition took place. And then you had a kind of a, our first military coup <laughs> that proclaimed republic in 15th of November of 1889. And uh, the coup was likely relevant for a presidential option because we have an, a parliamentary monarchy. And then you have a coup. And then you had the, the, the end of the, the regime. And then the, the general that took the lead of the coup was made our first president. And so we had a pretty authoritarian, non-competitive republic until 1930. When, you know, all over the world you have political turmoil in the 30s. And you had um, uh, another coup in 1930 that took Getulio Vargas to power, first in a provisional government, then at the constitutional one at 34, then in 37 there was a kind of a, another coup that made Getulio Vargas a dictator that lasted, a regime that lasted until the end of the war, then you have Getulio Vargas ousted, and you have our first competitive democratic experiment from 19. 45 owners until 64. It was after the war. Then you have the first democratic experience with kind of a uh, moderate multi party system with kind of three more relevant parties. And then you had in another wave of instability in the continent. We had our share of our military dictatorship between 60s, uh, 20, 21 years, between 64 and 85. I was already at college when we have the last transition from 85 on, and the last constitution is from 88, 30 years. And you have kind of a routine of elections and, and elected government in a competitive environment for the last 30 years. You know, let me see. Well, just for comparison, lots of things happened during a period. Until 1993, we have a, from late 80s until early 90s, we have a kind of a political uh, transition. As it used to happen, we have a political transition that goes hand in hand with economic crisis. You know, an economic crisis just destabilize the previous military regime, then you have a transition, and the new democracy had to grasp with a serious economic crisis, and then we only, with high inf inflation, about 100% every year, about a couple of digits inflation rate by a month, 10%, 12%, 20%, at, at most some 50% a month of inflation, until 93, so it's kind of from 94 onwards that you have some kind of political and economic stabilization for the last 25 years. So until 93, we have seven constitutions. Uh, six of them took place uh, in 20th century. Um, inflation in 1993 we're of 2,000, almost 2,300 percent. Inequality, pretty much, but Gini index was pretty much the double of the, Amer the US inequality. 10 finance ministers in eight years, 11 central bank presidents in the same period. Um, 
presidential, proportional representation, multi-party regime, an effective number of parties of 8.7 uh, by the end of the process in 1990, one of the highest of the world. Until then, only one democratically elected civil president had finished his term in the entire Brazilian history. It was uh, Juscelino Kubitschek. And then, uh, you know, I kind, kind of added <laughs> some data here for the, the second period. And from 1995 to 2014, there's our longest period of economic and political stability of 20 years. It has, you know, some inflation was by the thousand, the annual rate of inflation came down to an annual mean of 7.2%. The Gini index fell down. We have only three finance ministers, only six central bank presidents, two only in the last 11 years, from 2003 to 2014. Uh, and, but as we, when we go to political institutions, the number of parties, of effective parties in the lower chamber were not going down, were not normalizing, but they were actually increasing. And it came to 13 relevant parties, most certainly the highest in the world. And at this point in 2019, there are 16 effective parties, you know, 30 parties we have at the lower chamber. Only three presidents in, 19, in the 20 years of 1995 to 2014 all re-elected. At least the first two have finished their two terms. The third didn't manage to, to reach that. Yes. So Brazil, not only a multi-party presidential system with record number of parties, but also it has proportional representation with open lists we don't have party lists that go to the polls, but you have individual campaigns and you, you can pick your representative from a thousand of candidates. And House and Senate with kind of similar powers and 27 states, thousands of municipalities. Um, corona, oh, some few analytical propositions for a diagnostic of this case. More than for the characterization of specific institutions, I, I, I like to base this in Leipzig, a Dutch political science scientist based on California for a few decades, and that made the distinguish between consociative, consociative and majoritarian, consociational and majoritarian institutions as you, you know, majoritarian institutions is, for instance, a majoritarian representation, just like United States, when you have a single member districts, the winner will take the seat and the losers will not have anything. You have a consociational trait in kind of a proportional system where you have 10 seats and if you have, your party have 10% it wins the seat. So, uh, at the beginning, in the 80s, it seemed that Lippert was talking about models of democracy, uh, models for different countries. But I think that more than for the characterization of specific institutional models, Lippert's model is useful for highlighting very clearly an underlying dimension of every political institution. That is, the concentration or dispersion of veto power. More than coherence, a good constitution will likely look for a balance, a decision system in which some traits apply to compensate, aptly compensate others. You know, instead of, you have a country that is majoritarian and a country that is consultative. Probably you're my likely, more likely to find uh, uh, in every country a combination that may be more or less fortunate, but a combination of majoritarian traits, institutional traits, with consociative institutional traits that kind of imbalance each other. That's my, where I'm looking for here. So, 
Under such a framework, every system should be precisely the opposite of a consistent or typical model. They should be a good mix of institutions that concentrate power with others that disperse it. This is made more formally and abstractly by George Sibelis in the famous book, Vito Plays. George Sibelis is a professor at UCLA in California. So, proper balance. If a decision system taken as a whole should seek an appropriate balance between majoritarian and consultational, consultational veto uh, traits, then one could analyze the Brazilian case and, as a system that compensates extreme dispersion of power at the electoral system with an extremely powerful presidency. That's what was where we were in the last decade. So, Sugar and Carey, a couple of American political scientists in a famous book called Presidents and Assemblies, uh, used to stress the point to Brazilian case as the most powerful presidency of the democratic world that used to streamline political process under multi-party presidentialism by a huge concentration of presidential agenda power, presidential decree authority, centralization of legislative process, and relaxed majorities for amending the Constitution. So it gave a lot of power to presidents in Brazil. You see some where we are going to, uh, kind of a, a comparison here, it's apt between Brazilian and American cases that have opposite solutions to the very same problem that I stated at the beginning. The US, in the US, you have a strictly majoritarian electoral system that concentrates power in a few groups, compensated by strong mutual checks among different branches of government and a kind of a relatively weak presidency. In Brazil, you have a kind of a permissive, so to speak, open list proportional electoral system that is somehow, let's say, compensated by a strong concentration of prerogatives on the executive branch. Uh, Mainstream Brazilian analysis in the last few decades, for example, our colleagues Argelina Figueiredo and Fernando Limonji, uh, in fact used to explain recent Brazilian government's relative success by the concentration of extraordinary prerogatives in the president's hands. Okay. So we, we somehow managed to, to overcome the, you know, the curse of multi-party presidentialism, because we compensated the dispersion of power among many parties with a strong concentration of powers in the executive hands, in the president. With, let's see where. It doesn't want to go here. So, we're only talking about institutions here. You know, it's worth a note of caution. As central as the institutions may be in managing or mismanaging our conflicts, these conflicts are antecedent, 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 antecedent to the explicit and conscious building of institutions. As O'Donnell once put it, Guillermo O'Donnell, an Argentinian political scientist, recently deceased, uh, institutions are the scars of previous conflict. If we have this or that institutional design, is, you know, you have a problem, you have to fix it somehow and the scars are there. Political institutions are our main operational levers. You can just change culture just like that. You know, we should behave differently, so let's go. It's not like that. You have somehow to pull some levers that are always institutional somehow. That, you know, they, they, they set the framing under which we take our decisions. But we should not be shy in pursuing also structural or sociological explanations for authoritarian or democratic regimes. Uh, and we have some indicators in, in Brazil that would allow some optimism at first sight. Besides institutional features of the new order, as the Cold War favored authoritarianism everywhere, 
Now the deep transformation of Brazilian society that took place, coincidentally or not, under military rule, ended up favoring democratic stabilization afterwards because you had a lot of more complex economy and society to handle. Let's see what, it, what this complex society do with kind of a Bolsonaro. Uh, let's just hope that it's going to be helpful, I don't know. You know, just to, to have some figures, in, in the 60s, we have a, a country of 70 million people that doubled its population by early 90s. And then you had from 150 million to 200 million people in 2010. The, the rural, rural urban mix, you know, went from 60 per, a population that was 60% rural in 1960s to 15% rural in 2010, in just 50 years. And at this point, we're still waiting for the census of next year that is itself in the middle of political discussion. Illiteracy among adults in 1960s and mid 20th century, it's were roughly half of the population. And came down to 20% in early 90s and to 10% 10 years ago. And it's now pretty much residual. And uh, uh, the primary, secondary, tertiary uh, distribution of labor force you know, primary sector being agricultural and extractivistic labor, secondary, basically industry, and tertiary services and commerce. And you had, you know, the majority of the labor force by mid 20th century were in primary sector. Then by early 90s, you have, you know, 50% tertiary urban work, and basically the other 50% were half, split in half between primary and secondary. In 2010, you have only 6% of the labor force in primary sector and a quarter of the labor force in industry and two thirds in the tertiary sector. At this point, it's not clear what's going on with our industry. It's very likely that the, the share of the labor force is going to be under uh, the 20% that it exhibited 10 years ago. We are going through a kind of a de-industrialization uh, process and the share of the industry in our uh, gross national product is declining more rapidly than it should be, especially as we were still catching up. And it's not a kind of a, an old industrialized country that's just going to high tech uh, services in uh, Silicon Valley, uh, you know, you, you may be emptying industrial plants, exporting this to China, but you have uh, high income, high tech uh, economy. Going, it's not the case. Uh, lots of people talk about a kind of a reprimarization of the economy and a, a, a kind of uh, early deindustrialization process. So we have a lot of uh, interrogations about uh, next year uh, what you expect about the census next 2020. So here we come to to a kind to the eve of our crisis. We had a, a system that, you know, despite the fact of being some, somehow some kind of unorthodox, it was working. And it looked stable and perhaps even uh, economic prosperous with a bit of luck. Everything was going to be fine. But, uh, we had some problems in the last five years that we're still struggling to, to, <laughs> to stop it from getting worse, because it's getting worse every year. And, you know, there was a, a, 
an Achilles heel, a, a, a vulnerability, a structural vulnerability for, in my evaluation of Brazilian system in, in political campaign financing. You have a, a structural fault there. Let's say a, talk a bit about this. You have so sheer urbanization, despite many years and serious drawbacks, that you know brought about a proliferation of organization as well as a fresh plethora of social movements that mainly under Labour Workers Party, the PT's political umbrella, found their way toward effective influence on the political system from early 80s until last decade. And you have some institutional differentiation and specialization taking place under 1988 constitution that was allowing the system to control itself. You have a, the a growing literature by mid, the, the middle of this decade, like Sergio Prats and Matthew Taylor and Marcos Pereira and Carlos, Carlos Pereira and Marcos Melo, that were pointing to what we call the web, the accountability web. Control of organizations, whistleblowers, autonomous institutions that would check, would be able to check the, our otherwise extremely powerful presidency. So that's the point. You know, some people were concerned that, well, if we are imbalancing uh, our system, empowering the president, perhaps we're will be courting a kind of authoritarian solution. And those people, you know, were bringing a, the optimistic counterpoint to this, that you know that we have a, a, an accountability web, a system of control, very differentiated, a lot of institutions that check the president. So until recently, things used to look pretty good. And the hidden variable, to my uh, to my opinion, campaign finance. It is a problem pretty much everywhere. But here it had really disruptive effects. Uh, an institutional feature that is crucial to the connection between formal political institutions and society at large. Because, you know, we, we have, you know, some people are richer, some people are poorer, but we are all equal in our political rights and have political equality, we go to polls and we vote and have the same, um, the same importance in this process. But, you know, you have to finance the campaigns. And then it, we may have different shares of influence in this process after all. If, if people with more money are expected to have more votes, then if, if I can do uh, if I can do larger donations than my counterparts to a political campaign, then I influence more votes, then I have more political power. So this kind of a campaign financing is, is it's not something that used to be at the center of political science uh, agenda. But it's, it's very critical because it somehow connects formal political institutions on one side, on one hand, and society at large and our inequality, the relations among the economic system and the electoral dynamics lies uh, largely in campaign financing. This is a drain through which economic elites continue to exert disproportional influence over politics. You may have, uh, in the Brazilian case, we had a counterproductive ceilings on donations. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a bit about it in a minute, and too many individual candidacies. What I, I mean about too many individual candidacies? We have open list proportional representation, so we have uh, individual candidacies. Uh, you have, I, I talked about our 53 Minas Gerais seats in the federal chamber. Well, it's not the case that each party sets its lists with 53 names, and we opt between the, those party lists. We don't have the list. We don't have a pre-ordered list. We have just, uh, each party is allowed to present, its coalition of parties is allowed to uh, present 
uh, a number of individual candidacies, candidacies that equals two times the number of seats available. So if we have uh, 53 seats for Minas Gerais at the Fender of Chamber, then it means that each coalition of parties may present 106 candidacies, individual candidacies. And then we vote for individual candidates. And then we uh, calculate the seats just like that, you know, uh, if a coalition had 10% uh, of the vote, then it will own uh, five seats. And who will take those five seats? The five guys with most voted guys at uh, that list. So they take, they conduct individual campaigns. And so at each election, we used to have a thousand or two thousand individual candidacies. You have 30 parties, and then each party may present about a hundred candidacies. So you may have even 3,000 parties, 3,000 candidates. And we used to have 2,000 candidates in the last election. So you have lots of individual candidacies. You, you cannot make political sense of 2,000 candidates just asking for a vote. It's, it's extremely fragmented, and they are politically weak, those candidacies. On the other hand, we have a ceiling on the nation that, well, it's a good thing. You should have ceilings on the nations. But the ceiling effective in Brazil it's a share of the income of the donor. So each one of us is able to legally donate until 10% of our gross income that we had in our, uh, how do you say that, imposed to your hand, <laughs> revenue, in our tax allowance. So if I earn a million, if I earn 10 million last year, then I, I may donate a million. If I made uh, 10,000 bucks, then I may donate a thousand. So the law, the law allows me to, to donate proportionally to what I have. So it's kind of weird. And then the rational candidate should seek for donations with who? They would go after rich people to have, they're not going to have a huge campaign, campaign for crowdfunding. It's not efficient if you have the, your whole budget sponsored by one uh, donator, one donor, if he is wealthy enough. So it's kind of a, you have, on one side you have an extremely fragment demand for money with a thousand candidates at the same district. On the other hand, you have a, an income ceiling, um, a ceiling on donation that is proportional to the, the wealthy, uh, to the wealth of the donors. So you have an extreme concentration of the supply of money with an extreme uh, dispersion of the demand for money. So you have a market for uh, electoral financing that it's hugely uh, unbalanced in favor of the donors. The donors have the upper hand in this market. The, if, if I am a big donor, if I make billion, I can donate a hundred of millions. If I make, you know, I don't know, 10,000, if I make uh, $50,000 a year, then I can donate only, if I, if I go insane, I will donate $5,000. So uh, it's not, it's really a, a, a game that is, you know, uh, campaign finance is, it, it's a, a, a pretty much a, a rich people business all around the world. But here we have a, a peculiarly perverse mechanisms that induces even more concentration of power in the source of money. So, concerns. We have a kind of a hyper-presidency that we used to 
to settle our system with a hyper-presidency that risks a too strong demoralization of the legislative branch. Weak legislature, legislatures, too many parties. People have relatively low identification with parties because the campaigns are individually co conducted and representatives. The long run effect, as always, remains to be seen. And it, it doesn't seem good at, the, at this point. Development of control institutions gave way to a feeling of increasing corruption as more malpractices surfaced, scandals became far more frequent. It's not that things were going worse in corruption, that we were, as much as we were unveiling processes that always took place. Then, when the economy faltered, and it faltered by early this decade, by the mid of the last decade, and yes, Dilma Rousseff's uh, government mismanaged economic policy. When the economy faltered, it revealed a system extremely dependent on the economic and the, the economic and presidential performance. As a bicycle that, you know, that's cliche, that permanently has to run or will fall. Victimization by success, rising life standards and consumption, rising expectations, relative deprivation, either, even under minor frustration. And the frustration in economic terms were not minor. We have the, the economy stalled by middle of this decade, and it was, things were made even worse with the prosecution of lots of scandals of corruption related to f campaign financing that basically stopped lots of in investment by great uh, con state contractors and Petrobras and things like that, and the economy just stopped. To sustain social improvements in a case like Brazil, we have, uh, we don't seek good advice with formula, nor state-led development, nor neoliberalism. They're a little more than slogans. State versus market trade-off is pretty short-sighted. We need them both, efficient, dynamic markets, as well as strong, fiscally and institutionally sound states in order to be able to step up productivity, produce enough wealth, and on the other hand, effective, effectively impose regulatory compliance. But as the political and economic environment soared, uh, you know, the space for compromising and uh, agreements, uh, constructive, uh, long-sighted agreements gave way to, you know, sh blame shifting and finger pointing and accusations and both sides and all sides were just fighting to imprison their own adversaries. The way it was traditionally organized, Brazilian state has been historically an instrument of income concentration more than distribution. So I don't think the left should have run to a defensive conservative corner in defense of it. We had space to a lot of constructive agenda, but uh, things deteriorated drastically. In the recent crisis, economically, we had the end of China-induced easy growth period with commodities boom of the last decade that favored the period under Lula government. And Rousseff had a very slow reaction to it that took her entire first term. Politically, we had this, what I call a spectacular clash between the accountability web and established electoral practice favored by the electoral system and its campaign financing rules. So the economy stalled and you have this, you know, foreseeable clash between the accountability web on the one side and the uh, our bad campaign financing rules in the other. Thoughts? Personally, I really don't believe that the case of Petrobras is all that different from Brazilian business as usual. Uh, and even so many other big companies around the world, both public and private. Lots of what's being brought to light concerns campaign funding, yes. Not only, but a good chunk of what concern politicians at least. At least. That's the way politicians are hooked and captured by schemes that goes far beyond their interests, strictly considered. 
politicians captured by economic power in rent-seeking sectors that are going after good public contracts, and they were willing to spend lots of money in campaign financing to have the, uh, friendly regulation and good contracts. So uh, they were prone to capture the parliamentary elite, uh, be it via campaign finance or credible tax evasion threats. And this is a global trend that affects equally emergent and developed countries alike. It is basically the most visible tip of the huge iceberg of the effects of the offshore economy of democracy all over the world. And we are all complaining about the zero tax people that don't pay tax at all. We have some conceptual challenge in campaign financing as a feature of electoral system that don't, we don't use to think about those things at this framing. And we don't have a good taxonomy. In Brazil, as we saw, we have presidential, federal, bicameral, open list PR, multi-party system. It shouldn't work by our Old Testament, but yet it worked pretty well in the last 20 years. We have mainstream Brazilian political science stressing this point. Uh, oddly, in Brazil, despite relative prosperity, politicians kept talking of reform. We had no consensus, but political reform was permanently in the legislative agenda with increasing public noise. I used to stress to highlight uh, how odd was a country where politicians claim for reform and intellectuals used to say that, you know, you should just calm down, everything is just fine. It was kind of, there's something wrong with a country where politicians wants to change and uh, academics wants to keep things as they are. We have a low appreciation of the political system by Brazilian Congress members by the beginning of this decade. It's kind of, you know, my, my guess is that those guys were familiar and were close and were seeing, had a personal experience with the, the backstage of political financing that we were not really seeing in the last decade. And we started to study this more systematically by the beginning of this decade. Uh, so, as I'm stressing, my suspicion, campaign finance is the problem. Both proposals of change in the electoral system were being uh, submitted in the, in the National Congress since 2003. And I was led to believe that, as I, as I told you, that they don't interact well. You know, we have this, the, the open field with hundreds of candidates just made place, made home for a huge dispersion of the demand for money and the rules that favor big donors just induces a huge concentration of the supply of the money. So, uh, but we don't have established theory on this interaction internationally. We have no available typology of campaign finance systems. You know, so we're academically, uh, scientifically, we're ill-equipped to deal with this. You know, my, my guess is about the interaction of the, the concentration and dispersion of the supply and demand of money in the electoral arena is just a, a guess. We don't, have a, uh, we don't have a field with comparative studies that are actually able to compare different, to plot different countries in a kind of a, 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 a Cartesian plan and to, to make a comparative diagnosis. So we have no in established theory of this interaction and no available typology of campaign finance systems. It's an open agenda. Offshore politics has a lot of, of consequence for this with tax havens, draining resources everywhere. There's so lots of gases, crude gases here that I just throw on the, <laughs> on the, the tail. And let me see. Uh, I made this presentation that I will use to, to close this, this talk here uh, and to make room for a, a conversation, if you like. I, I made this presentation in, by the eve of Bolsonaro election, kind of a couple of days before I was in 
in Denmark, in Copenhagen, and the International Anti-Corruption Conference. It's a kind of a, a curious setting because lots of it's not that much academic. It's lots of people from NGOs and World Bank and multilateral institutions kind of grasping how to deal with corruption, but I, I, I thought it was in a pretty much single-minded uh, thing that you just uh, get rid of those things with good controls and are not really looking for the iceberg below the surface of the what's going on. And lots of the corruption literature uh, feels excessively at ease with rankings of most corrupt and least corrupt countries. But if you think just 10 seconds, you realize that corruption is transnational. You know, it's a kind of an asset that is laundered offshore somehow. And it's not simply kind of uh, local corruption is not, not even close to be the, the one that, that levers the highest volumes of resources. But, well, I made this presentation that I will just summarize here. This kind of a script for me. I know, I was, first of all, a kind of a disclaimer. Okay, the fight against corruption is a trivial corollary of rule of law. Nobody can be reasonably against the fight against corruption. Nobody can be publicly uh, for corruption. <laughs> But we need a sustainable fight against corruption. Democracy is a necessary condition for any fight against corruption, sustainable or not, even though it will not always be sufficient, of course. The fact that we have democracies is not guaranteed that we will be fighting corruption. And we tend to take it for granted. We, take, we tend to take democracy for granted once achieved. But it's not always the case. So we do have a problem if the fight against corruption is perceived as a fight against politicians in general, as crackdowns on corruption tend to be seen. As corruption is a crime that necessarily involves public agents' misconduct, a war on corruption will very easily be perceived as a fight against the state, the political system, or even more commonly against political parties. And yet, a strong state machinery with robust routines and reciprocal checks among agents and controllers, backed by organized party competition, this is important, is what we need to fight corruption. An organized party competition where rival parties with societal roots keep their eyes open over one another is precisely what we need if we want to keep corruption checked. And it cannot be taken for granted either. An institutionalized party systems might take several decades in the making. Curbing down corruption is always necessarily a slow process that goes hand in hand with stronger institutions. Standard patronage in pre-democratic context will always look like corruption from a modern standpoint. So, for example, complaints about corruption in Hamid Karzai's Afghanistan or Yasser Arafat Palestinian Authority always sounded to me as unfair charges. We're still in state building. You're still kind of putting up your political system. You have to settle down. If you're not killed, it's okay. So you, you're by your opponents <laughs> to support you. You have to do it. Otherwise, they will kill you. <laughs> so it's kind of a... Uh, at this point, you can realistically expect no corruption. So people are killing each other. So uh, Hamid Karzai in Afghanistan is my favorite showcase. You, have, you had 9-11, and then the United States moved understandably against the Al-Qaeda uh, havens in Taliban's Afghanistan. The whole world, it's not rigorously legal in international standards, but the whole world look at it with understanding. <laughs> and it was taken as natural. And then you have the Taliban ousted and you had a new government led by one of 
the warlords of northern Afghanistan that happened to be Hamid Karzai. And he had to survive. <laughs> he had to just stay alive and to stabilize a, a kind of political system under such a dramatic circumstance, an international occupation uh, with a, 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 in a country in a continuous and decades of civil war. And so you had to have, you have to coalesce a lot of groups under your leadership. You do whatever it takes, okay? And you have to bribe some people. You, you're not even think about not doing that. You know, oh, 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 it's not legal. It would be corruption. You have to stay alive. Okay, people are killing each other. So, so it's, it, it seemed to be... So uh, 10 years later, then Hamid Karzai uh, was ousted uh, and substituted by, for, by uh, another leader, also sponsored by American forces. And, you know, you, we started to see lots of uh, op-eds in Western media about how corrupt was Hamid Karzai government. Come on, what do you expect? <laughs> what could we all expect in such a circumstance? Would you expect simply the rule of law and people just uh, having uh, impersonal uh, allocation of goods and resources by uh, the, the due process of law uh, under uh, when you're at the same time under foreign occupation fighting Taliban? And it's, it's not really, it's, it's pretty much uh, laughable. So uh, it's kind of, at, at, the, at this kind of rough institutional setting, it's, it's always lots of compromises that are settled upon the exchange of mutual favors in whatever it takes, the shapes. Of course, leaving apart, leaving apart this case, Brazil doesn't have a right to the same excuse, of course. But we don't fare that bad in corruption experience indexes either. You have a perception of corruption far high, higher than our experience of corruption index. So this is telling. When we, we are asking people about uh, if they experienced paying money or receiving offers of money for this or that, it's not that common in Brazil as it is the affirmative question about Brazil is a corrupt quest country. Yes, 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 yes it is. <laughs> you know, so one thing is the idea that, you know, I see a lot of this stuff in the TV. The other is, have you experienced that? And Brazil, in this case, fare in a much more middle rank uh, standard. So, every time corruption looks systemic, plaguing large chunks of the electoral process, for instance, as it is the case in Brazil, my bet is that we face serious regulatory institutional deficiencies. That's not to minimize the problem. A regulatory deficiency may be more difficult to curb than crime. Asymmetrical legal influence over politics may well be worse than corruption. If you have the upper hand in writing the law, why would you have to break it? Brazilian interaction among electoral system and campaign financing regulation is severely flawed. We have no time for the details here, but it, I already pretty much shared it with you. Uh, but it produced a vicious market for campaign financing with especially strong effects in legislative elections with a highly fragmented demand for money with hundreds of individual candidacies at each district and an unbelievably concentrated supply of money as a donation ceiling is a percentage of donors' gross income. A severe regulatory problem would bring sooner or later judicial problems. But it was long treated as a strictly judicial problem, as if there were nothing else going on. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, I hate this. Uh, at a point 
in which legal, private, although extravagant, electoral donations are routinely depicted as bribed by prosecutors, by plea bargainers, by the media, and now, since 2016, by the courts. You know, we, we started, a couple of years ago, we started to prosecute people. A couple of years ago, about a hundred of representatives were prosecuted in a single decision by Supreme Court Justice. Using largely as pro probatorial material, legal donations that were just too much money. But you know, it's a lot. It's, the law permits, but it's absurd. Uh, JBS alone, a kind of a meat industry, run by notorious Joesley Batista, uh, JBS alone uh, made uh, 300 millions of reais in 2014 election and donations. It was uh, one-tenth, 10% of all the money in the campaign was provided by JBS. For, of course, it smells bad, but it was legal. It was less than 2% of their uh, gross income. Uh, it cannot work that way. It reminds me the heterodox shocks that plagued anti-inflationary policies in the 80s. Prices freezing, political demagoguery, public euphoria, and severe deterioration of the economic environment in the aftermath. I can't help expecting the same about corruption fighting in Brazil for the next years. We may even destroy the political regimes, regime and things will always look worse. A kind of a, I used to, to, to play in a small piece with this parallel. You know we had the Real Plan, Plano Real, that was in 94, uh, the, the, our watershed between high inflation and low inflation. But before, in the 80s, we had lots of plans that freezed prices and changed the, the currency and things like that. The most notoriously, the, 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 the Cruzado plan, Plano Cruzado. And I used to say that Lava Jato is the Plano Cruzado of corruption fighting. You know, kind of a spasm, a kind of a, 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 a shock of repression with... Uh, no realistic way of dealing with the problem. Lava Jato is a conscious imitation of Mani Pulite, as it is testified by Sergio Moro Piz from 2004, where he touts many kinds of unconstitutional civil rights abuses in order to use the media to keep pressure over the political system. The bad results of the Italian case are already manifest. Now Brazil drifts the same way with darker implications. In our case, human rights and civil rights are by now electoral, electorally framed, as they were electorally framed last year, as dangerous leftism, and death squads are receiving a political carte blanche with frightening consequences at the next corner. As courts have been dragged to the center of political infighting, as they are in this very week, they started to lack the authority needed to adjudicate potentially bloody disputes, especially as the Supreme Court has been shifting jurisprudence quite frequently on sensitive matters, occasionally against the letter of the law, as it's notoriously the case about uh, the imprisonment of former President Lula. The fight against corruption is badly needed and welcome when it is itself strictly legal, conducted under established constitutional framing. Its success requires explicit routine circumspection and self-restraint by prosecutors, consistent checking, a better equipped accountability web. And we were building it, most of all along the last couple of decades, as lots of studies testify. But this web remained itself largely unchecked. Perhaps PT's worst legacy, by a mix of arrogance and naivety, the party might well have weakened controls over controllers. By lots of traits, they, they gave way to, to abuses uh, by the controllers. At this point, closing up, 
Brazilian political system falls adrift, prey to an institutional predator, Jair Bolsonaro, that happened to seem weird enough to attract loads of people sickened by years of sensationalist media coverage of political corruption. It is going to get worse, even about corruption. The bigger chains of corrupt transactions are nowadays transnational, especially the so under financial deregulation and the proliferation of tax havens and secrecy that allows for staggering figures of tax evasion and illicit international financial flows. I simply cannot see how can we hope for a less corrupt political environment at the national or transnational level if we adopt the rhetoric of purging entire political systems that new, democracy manage, new democracies manage, however precariously, to build. That's it. <laughs> well, uh, I hope that it makes sense. You know, we had to, to fly over a lot of small piece of information. I hope not to have destroyed all the time we had. I don't know. Uh, still, 10, 15, it's a nice time. I don't know what you used to do at this point. We have some break, or if we go immediately to some conversation, but it's up to you what you used to do. I'm glad to follow you. How do we manage this? Thing? Okay. Five minutes break. Okay. Well, I think the uh, the best we can do now <laughs> is to start uh, chatting a bit about uh, politics. You know, I had to encapsulate in pretty much an hour of exposure, of exposition, of lots of information about Brazilian politics. And uh, as I told you, I didn't, I wasn't quite clear about where to start, <laughs> and I tried to. To, to explain a bit of things about the electoral system and party dynamics and, and things like that, trying to converge to Brazilian current politics in a, in a glimpse. Well, now I, uh, I'm at, at your disposal to any doubt, questions, complaints, please. I don't know if you need a, mic a microphone too. What, how are you doing this? Are you recording? I don't know. Here it comes. So, guesses? So who wants to begin? No one? Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, my name is Luisa. I study here at um, also the science, um, the Department of Political Science. Um, one thing I think everyone might be really interested to hear is about our current situation with uh, the governo Bolsonaro and how the Lava Jato scandal um, kind of interacts with the current government. I um, wanted to ask your opinion on how Bolsonaro is dealing with um, a lot of issues like especially social issues and the way that our political system works. How, because to me it, seem, it seems that his position is very much of um, neglecting, neglecting the this, a system we have in Brazil. Well, uh, Bolsonaro is a, a very, very, very unfortunate development uh, that uh, it wasn't foreseen but lots of people say uh, a couple of years ago uh, uh, it doesn't seem possible uh, if if you 
ask people about his, his prospects in mid-2017, there would be few people, very, very few people betting on Bolsonaro prospects. Lots of people would say that he was bluffing just by uh, setting, saying he was going to run for president. Oh, he's just wanting to show up and to bolster uh, his campaign possibly for the Senate from Rio de Janeiro and things like that. Um, what made it possible? Well, first of all, uh, the sources of stability in Brazilian case are not rooted in some kind of shared sense of political values under the norms and principles <coughs> of rule of law. It was never the case. <coughs> And um, so it's a system of society is structurally vulnerable for authoritarianism. It's very, very, very receptive for authoritarian solutions if things go bad. It's, it, it, it was always captured in surveys at, at any point. We only rivals with some case of Russia, things like that. The, the risk. The, our welcoming to authoritarian solution for economic crisis or, or problems of social order and things like that is very strong. But uh, above all, we have a, a kind of years and years of a very negative and sickening coverage of politics. You know, the, the, our prime time, uh, TV news program used to to set the scenery for political news in a kind of a, 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 a plump with mud and rats and money figures in the in the back. When we're talking about politics, we're talking about something dirty, and you know, it, and so the things it it was it made per perfect sense in hindsight that people just went to a candidate that showed no respect for democracy or anything like that. Come on, what you're talking about? You're just showing the horrors of democracy every, every nighttime show. And why should I care about democracy? So, but uh, I think that he was just the, Bolsonaro is an extreme solution because he was for 30 years. It, it's it's funny in some sense because when the the the, the politicians and the National Congress fares the lowest in public opinion, then the electorate picks uh, one of the longest serving deputies <laughs> at the Congress, and the last of of them all, the 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 one guy that were the weirdest the one that never coalesced with nobody. But that made him somehow appear some kind of maverick. And he's just the guy, the, the last one of all our horrible representatives. So some kind of twist made him uh, appeal just because he were, you know, weird. He, he looked different. And people were, justifiably sick about the news and it was some since 2000 since late 2014 we were in the same mood every single night we had new prisons new uh, schemes revelated and uh, about uh, political financing about uh, contracts, irregular contracts with state-owned firms, especially Petrobras, and things like that. So we have the whole uh, framing, of a, a negative framing for politics in general. And then you had this guy that was always his own representative of the fringe of the political system that were weird and all enough to appeal to some court. And then it, there was the, the, the strong resilience of the, 
the voting for the Workers' Party. That made lots of people uh, vote for Bolsonaro as a, a lesser evil uh, at, the, at the decisive moment. You know, Bolsonaro has never, had never, until the last couple of weeks, he had never more than 30%. And then he skyrocketed till 46% of the first leg, uh, but lots of people scared with the, the, the very concrete possibility of the PT winning once again. So it was a, this, this matching of two factors. Lots of people truly disenchanted with the political system at large and even democracy itself. That it was a kind of a minority still. And lots of people that simply uh, couldn't handle the possibility of a fifth victory, fifth straight victory of PT. Be it because they were never uh, sympathizers of Workers' Party from the beginning, be it for people that simply couldn't stand anymore the same mood at the primetime TV. <laughs> it was always, oh no, it's not going to stay the same thing all over for four more years. You see, lots of people that simply could stand anymore, and lots of us couldn't simply stand anymore. That you know, so if PT wins again, then all the the setting, all the scenery, all the mood stays the same in our uh, in our traditional polarization, and things are, are not going better. You know, unfortunately, Bolsonaro is a uh, a jump in darkness, <laughs> completely in all senses, in all metaphorical sense that you could stare. He was never committed, uh, even superficially, to no procedure that was formal or impersonal or democratic, anyway. The kind, just an appeal, very rough about, I, I, I used to call him uh, just after taking office, uh, a predator. That's a, a figure, a metaphor that I use today again. It's a kind of a predator. You know, the, the political system was a feeble prey at that point. And Bolsonaro is a predator. It's a kind of the, the guy that is hostile to the system. Uh, what's his platform? What's his... Uh, he has no policy advice. He has no policy repertoire. He just... What a, Wherever he sees a policy or a bureaucratic or impersonal procedure, he, his gut instinct is just to dismantle it. So let's undo it. Okay, so in a, in a, in a country like Brazil, it may simply uh, give, way, give, way, give way to, to violence. You know, it's kind of a, 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 a country where we're still struggling for uh, rule of law. We have just 30 years of continuous rule of law. Uh, in just a kind of a, you know, one generation. Okay. When from, we have the, the, the age of our fathers when the Constitution was written. Now, so it's just a matter. You have a, a lot of, of hard time to just... Um, providing the police forces uh, with good intelligence about uh, fighting crime. They used to rely basically on violence. And, and that's why it is a, this is a deep affinity that a, uh, a government led by Bolsonaro has with private militias. Because it's just, you know, there are some bad guys there out there doing bad things, so let's kill them. <laughs> so the, and you know, there are all those human rights guys that don't know what they're talking about. They're just some commies and kind of, it's very rough material. And, and the Brazilian circumstances must be profoundly destructive. That's the point. Someone? Good morning. Uh, thank you for the presentation. My name is Mahdeng. I'm also a student here in UFMG. And uh, my question is related to hers. 
Uh, okay, it could be like a dumb question, but here we go anyway. Uh, what do you think is happening from now on? I mean, some people are saying he will not be able to keep this, uh, this for, for these four years. Some people say he's quitting. Some people say we have this vice who's going to kick him. Uh, what do you think is happening? I mean, uh, in your opinion, and like personal opinion, mm -hmm. where do you think we're going? Okay. Well, let's speculate here. Um, it, it's a kind of, it's very, uh, uh, it's not a typical government, so we're not in charted terrain here to just, you know, when you have this and this trait, then you expect this or that. We're kind of a, in a, in a misty environment that is hard to discern where, what, what to expect next. Uh, well, there are lots of things here possible. First, uh, its own relation with Lava Jato. It's kind of murky. And he was uh, made possible his, uh, by Lava Jato itself. Then he just co-opted Sergio Moro. So there was the Lava Jato party, the anti-corruption party, let, let's say like that, uh, tend to merge with Bolsonaro. Then you had um, Queiroz and the, the Bolsonaro's aid that were uh, being investigated by kickbacks to Flavio Bolsonaro. So, of course, Queiroz works close with Jair Bolsonaro for 40 years. He's not a Flavio man. He's a the president's man. And at this point, you have the Supreme Court move to halt the investigation. And so it, it tends to put a, a lot of stress in this coalition between uh, Lava Jatistas and Bolsonaristas, <laughs> because uh, at this point, uh, lots of people uh, involved with Lava Jato, Lava Prosecutors, they were very loud uh, and outcrying against the Supreme, the Supreme Court decision, uh, denouncing that it was the strongest blow that Lava Jato ever suffered. And it came in a decision that was demanded by uh, the president's son. So it's kind of a, uh, it's a tricky environment. It's hard to discern all the people, lots of groups that were not that relevant, that became relevant in Brazilian politics in recent months. Uh, not only uh, the religious evangelical blocs that I, I think that they, they came closer to power and they are not going backwards. They, they, they will stay uh, more influent than they used to be for decades to come. Uh, uh, I, I think this is a unfolding that must be respected. Uh, lots of people that really converted to evangelical religion, it's not going back. Uh, Bolsonaro may be short-lived, may be a short-living figure in all they think, but all the darker content that comes up to the fore with him tend to stick, I think. That's the point. Uh, you know, some things may happen for accident in the, in the first sight. And then Bolsonaro shows himself to be, you know, unfit for office and somehow be kicked aside by Moura, a general, a general that is his vice president that seems more suitable to the job, more normal than Bolsonaro. Then it's, it's likely, it's, it's, it's imaginable that Bolsonaro be sidelined at some point by some way. But I don't think that all the repertoire, the political repertoire, that some kind of, uh, some, some positions that are more openly politically authoritarian and socially conservative, that came to the, to protagonism with him, they are not receding. I, I think they came to, to stay. And this, even if Bolsonaro is unsuccessful in the end himself. 
personally. So I, it's possible, perhaps it's pretty much likely that PT may survive as the, the main receptor of leftist voting. It serve, I, I, I think the 2018 election was a survival election for PT, and it was successful in this point of view. They managed to have 45 percent. With they, they, they lost two thirds of their local mayor mayorships and uh, municipal elections, local elections in 2016. And then it fared very badly for them for parliamentary elections in 2018, since they lost the support of two thirds of their local power. Then we could expect a shortening, a deep shortening of their representation in the lower chamber in Brasilia. And they managed to stay alive with the larger, you know, they have a cut from 70 to 50 deputies, but the fragmentation is so deep that they managed to stay as the bigger party and the, for, for a tiny fraction over, over Bolsonaro's party. So it's quite symbolic because it was 11% of the, the seats, but it's a, it's a feat. And um, if they don't panic, <laughs> they tend to survive with the memories uh, of the successes of Lula and presidency and the virtual monopoly they, sh they have over unions and civil life. And so I think that they is, tend to survive as one, one side of the basic political cleavage. Uh, the other side is harder to see. Will be if Bolsonaro is going to a second run, Sergio Moro. Um, I, I, some general, perhaps Moro. You know, anything can happen. João Doria, the, the, the governor of São Paulo, you know, the governor of São Paulo is always a contender, and he owns PSDB at this point. So lots of things. Uh, a TV star like Luciano Huck, I don't know. <laughs> it may be anything, you know. And, a lot, and nothing will be uh, worse than Bolsonaro. Come on, <laughs> let's be realistic. The worst already happened. Uh, it may, uh, things may go worse because Bolsonaro is president, so it, it, it tends to produce effects. Uh, but we are not going... N Nothing allows us to, to, to believe that it, we already reached the bottom. We are still going down, you know? Yes, and this is sad, but it's true. We, we lost some 10% of our GNP in, in the last five years. And it's not going, going better in no short time. Thank okay. you. So, yeah, that's, that's true. I, I do believe that, well, in due time, five years, ten years from now, it's, it's going to, to, things are going to, to go better, okay? But at this point, when we turn up, we, we are, Brazil is going to be experiencing something we never experienced. That, uh, and some, some neighbors already had, Argentina, for example. There is to face a, a, a poor country that then we had uh, a couple of decades before. So the, this, our, our, the next generation will face it. Uh, we will have a, a, a country that will be less industrialized, more reprimarialized, let's see. It, it will be more authoritarian, more corrupt, more poorer, you see, it's more violent than it used to be. I don't, I don't see any way out of this. We are going to live this, okay, in the, the next 10 years. Okay. And then start, we are going to start over again in the lower level. Uh, this crisis is, is this serious. I, I can't see other ways. So uh, we are going, 
and, and if things stabilize more quickly, say, uh, let's say that Bolsonaro is basically an ineffective president and then he's ousted or irrelevant at 2022, and then we have some kind of normalization in politicians and media and, uh, you know, and patronal associations frightened by the, the prospects start to cooperate with each other and have a more prudent, moderate tone and things stabilize. This is the best scenario. Then by 22, we have a succession of uh, uh, weakened Bolsonaro with a more cooperative environment among political elites. That would be perfect. <laughs> it's the best we can hope. Uh, I do believe that uh, in such a scenario, it will be, there will be a left-wing candidacy probably led by PT. And on the other side, a kind of a coalition that will never resemble again the Fernando Henrique Cardoso's PSDB. It will never be that Avenida Paulista Tucanismo. Okay. It will be something more uh, socially conservative, politically authoritarian coalition that will be uh, vocalizing the more market-friendly agenda. It will be a, an environment more uh, harsh, more ideologically divided in, in a in a way that will be deeper than the experience, our experience under the, in the 90s and the years, the first decade of this century. From, you know, we had a peculiarly peaceful political environment between uh, color impeachment, between 1992 and 2013. 21 years of ex exceptional uh, stability, for good or bad. But it was, uh, uh, even the universities were calm, <laughs> you see? Uh, politicians wanted, the, 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 that funny thing that I used to stress, politicians want to change a few things and intellectuals just, oh, you know, things are perfect, just forget about it. <laughs> you know, academics were just saying everything was fine, it was okay, the world was perfect, it was going to go better, you know, it's kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a caricature here, but we used, the mood was very optimistic. Uh, the politicians were the ones that, you know, there, there are some problems right here. And we used to read this just like, uh, you know, they're losing ground to PT, so they are complaining. And that was not that simple. And at this point, when we stabilize again, it will be, um, you, you see, the, the former configuration after the successes, the redistributive successes of Lula, uh, it was very biased for the PT because, you know, PSDB lost the, what Fernando Henrique himself called the povão, <laughs> and, the, the, and it was, they were confined to a small fraction of upper middle classes and some rural uh, southerner fringe of the electorate. And the median voters were, were, was, in the last 10 years, clearly uh, petista. Cle not, not necessarily petista, but lulista, yeah. pro PT. So 2014 was an unfortunate election, it was an election when even under the, the signs of weaknesses and the vulnerabilities of the, the first term of Dilma Rousseff, Dilma still managed to win and I feel that at that point, lots of people just gave up. And, you know, it's not going to work that way. And lots of, of a, a good chunk of the political elites were, at, were prone to, to adopt more harder practice and harder tactics to, to go after an impeachment, you know. And it, it was a kind of a, an unfolding 
that was, you know, lots of things were going in parallel. Lava Jato was an, a, a sign of, of excessive autonomization of uh, organs of control that were not controlled, they were not checked themselves. On the other side, we had this vulnerability in the backstage of campaign financing and you have the, the economic mismanagement of Dilma. And so it was a huge clash. And I, I do believe that the, the, the Dilma's presidency was one of the fragments of this clash. And, but at that point, nobody, no one of the, the, the leading proponents of the impeachment was dreaming about Bolsonaro. It was not a foreseeable uh, unfolding. So it was, you know, the PT is going to be out of power, and then there will be Temer, and then Alckmin would be in a good position to win, and things just stay as they were, but perhaps with some tilting, again, of the electoral balancing uh, away from the PT back to PSDB. And then we'll, we'll have some shaking, some trembling, some crisis, but it will resume the, the, the former uh, polarization between PT and PSDB. Perhaps it could have worked, I don't, we, we will never know. Perhaps the implication of Aesio Neves with the, 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 the cooperation by Joesley Batista had derailed the PSDB. Perhaps it was the, the assassination attempt against Bolsonaro that could have saved his candidacy and, uh, and uh, derailed the final, the Gerald Walkman. We'll never know. But at this point, I, I do see it that, you know, uh, the religious evangelical base used to vote for PT until 2010 by Edir Macedo, Silas Malafaia, etc. They were with Lula. And it was not a kind of an organic alliance. It was just a leadership combination. But they were delivering votes for Petit, not after the impeachment. And at this point, they were provide, they were probably the, the crucial source of votes that gave the edge to Bolsonaro. So they learn that they have a way to define elections themselves. So I, I, I don't see them stepping back from that position. At this point, they are not prominent in the, administ in the Bolsonaro administration. And it may turn them bitter against Bolsonaro too. But I would bet they, they would try to take advantage of the possibly pivotal position at this point. And then I, I, I think that we'll have to get used to a scenery where they will be very prominent in electoral alliances and the definition of our electoral cleavage. And they may try to take advantage of this. See, so this is how I'm, I'm looking forward. I, I don't know, I, I can tell about the prospects of Bolsonaro, Jair Bolsonaro himself. He may be turned irrelevant quite quickly. But I, know, I don't know what to expect about uh, Bolsonarismo and all the symbolic repertoire that uh, it, it brings to, to the fore. Their sons, they are pretty young. And so uh, Bolsonaro is, is, is a very frail figure personally himself. Everyone who saw him at Davos felt the limitation of the guy. He, he was in panic. He was frightened to the death with that occasion. He can't stand that. But I don't know if, her, if his sons would care to just go there and entertain uh, their show. 
So uh, I, I think even if they are caught in impeachment and things like that, I think they tend to remain as main characters in our web, uh, how to call it? <laughs> this, yeah, this, uh, you know, this, this new media things, WhatsApp and Twitters and things like that, that conforms the landscape. And if not them personally, there will be lots of people doing their speech. And so I, I think this deterioration of the terms of or, or coexistence of different currents in our political landscape, it will be for long. So we will have to handle with our economic problems and things like that in a, in a political environment that will be bitter than it used to be. So that's uh, what I can see. Good morning, thank you for your presentation. Um, so I have two questions. Mm -hmm. um, my first question regards like the um, sort of racial discourse here in Brazil, because personally I'm not surprised about the rise to power of Bolsonaro. It totally makes sense, consider the past, um, uh, the political past of Brazil, the corruption scandals and these anti-establishment movements worldwide. So it totally makes sense, but what um, I wanted to ask you about is the sort of racial component of the political discourse and whether it is present at all in Bolsonaro's discourse because generally if you look if we look at the right wing political movements in Europe or the US they are pretty uh, um, xenophobic and uh, racist based on white supremacy discourse so do you have this in like does Bolsonaro sort of play uh, this racial card that's my first question and well if it does how because I guess you have to be pretty strategic about it in such a, I don't know, it doesn't really make sense for me to have like a racial discourse in such a multi-ethnical country, but still I'm curious to learn about that. And also, um, I just was wondering about the turnout um, rates here in Brazil. How do a lot of people vote? Or is this political disillusionment you were telling us about sort of affecting the turnout in the, in the past few years? Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, it's kind of messy, uh, <laughs> the, the, the stand of Bolsonaro about race. Um, there are lots of racist rants in Bolsonaro's rhetoric. He's very little measured. It's not, uh, if you think about Donald Trump and his kind of a, a verbal excesses that, that you know, that project wants to project some kind of spontaneity. Uh, Bolsonaro also likes to do the same thing and to sound popular, familiar, like uh, uh, pub chatting and things like that. But he, differently from Trump, he avoids to play explicitly the race card because it's Brazil. <laughs> it's not. The, the United States not that easy, but uh, on the policy level, he is very uh, hostile. Tends to be his camp tends to be very hostile to affirmative action policies that took place in the last few decades, as kind of you know uh, undo privilege and reverse racism and things like that. So it's kind of perhaps deliberately ambiguous in this, in this sense. But yes, it's hostile to affirmative action initiatives and policy level. And is hostile to, it dismantled lots of councils of policy, councils that PT excelled in, in multiply, councils for policies of all over the the place about youth and about blacks and about women and things like that, it was pretty much dismantled 
under Bolsonaro administration. So uh, they lose their niches of, they lost their niches of influence, those minorities that they used to, they were able to conquer in the last few decades. And it is always, as in the case of the United States, disguised in some kinds of general appealing discourse, calling the, the minorities causes of women and LGBTs and blacks a kind of special interests, you know? They, they twist the, the discourse about it. It's pretty paralleled by, in the, in the framing, the general framing of the discussion is very similar to the Republican repertoire in the United States. But, uh, you know, Bolsonaro in the last days of his campaign and the first days of his administration, he used to, he liked to, to, to make himself being photographed with a, a black friend and collaborator that used to be always in his back. Uh, like, uh, you know, this is my pal, and he's black, and you know, so I'm not a racist, and this kind of subliminar uh, uh, text that is always being messaged. You can't really simply uh, give a pro-white speech uh, in a country like Brazil without simply uh, losing tons of votes. But yes, uh, the the main electoral cleavage in Brazil since 2006, mostly, became pretty much uh, paralleled with class and income and even race with, uh, after Lula's first mandate, when he was re-elected in 2006, you have a, a, an electoral uh, displacement that the poorer came to vote for Lula in 2006, 2010, 2014, and again in 2018, voting for Haddad. So the poorest regions, so PT won last year in Northeast country, uh, and in each capital, in each great city, PT tends to be more voted, best voted in the poor neighborhoods and be it PSDB or Bolsonaro tend to be best voted in the richest neighborhood. So this is a kind of, this was never the case in Brazil. In Brazil during military dictatorship you had uh, more a capital versus interior cleavage. But the capital's vote is for the opposition and the rural and minor towns in the interior voted for uh, the government, the military rulers in, in the 70s and 80s. After Lula coming to power in 2000 and seeking re-election in 2006, this election of 2006, the, the, the second election of Lula, was uh, uh, an election that signaled very clearly a kind of a income cleavage, where poor population tending to vote for Lula and PT, and the richest one tend to vote against Lula and PT. And this, it stays. Of course, since 2006, the edge for PT was declining. So the edge in 2010 was, uh, was not as big as 2006, and then 2014, Dilma almost lost to ISU Neves, and then 2018, Bolsonaro win. So, but but the, 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 the overall picture didn't change with the, the, the inclination, the basic inclination in this, this way. Uh, the second, your second question about after blacks and I was just interested uh, to learn about the turnout rate. Turnout, yes. Yeah, like you know, our our in our electoral system, our the voting is mandatory. It's almost symbolic because you just pay three, three, five reais, it's kind of a couple of dollars, <laughs> as fine, uh, not show for not showing up. It's very easy, 
not in a couple of minutes in the lecture, the, the, the enrollment, the registerment as a lecturer is mandatory. We're all enrolled. Uh, the, the logistics of the elections is very development, is very well developed. It's easy and safe to vote in Brazil. You just, you walk away a couple of blocks from your home, typically, in a, in a big city like Belo Horizonte, and in half an hour you're back at home, so it's easy to show up. The numbers are declining, but they are slowly declining. And you have something about 80% of, turn, of turnout. So uh, uh, lots of people used to make those odd calculus that, uh, you know, uh, there were uh, only 80%, 20% didn't show up and they just, since this figure is going up, people always do alarming news about this, and then they, they discount lots of people that once there they vote blank, they abstain, or they, they deliberately vote for a non-existent number that just annuls the vote, and they then discount all this, and, they, and then they say, the news just say, uh, have only 60% of the people turned out, and so only a few more than 30% of the Brazilian electorate vote for Bolsonaro. And so he's not legitimate. This, this is crazy, you know. Under this kind of standard, no, no election will be legitimate, no place at all. Uh, but uh, our turnout is pretty high because of this administrative setting. The, the enrollment is mandatory, so we all have our electoral card, so to speak, and then uh, it's easy to show up and vote, and uh, but on the other hand, the fine if you don't show up is just a couple of dollars, so it's, it's, it's cheaper than a bus ticket, so it's not a big deal. It's if you don't want to show up, it's not really a big deal, but people is used to go, so roughly seven, three quarters or four fifths of the population used to show up. So I think obviously the media plays a massive part in influencing the vote around the country. Um, I was just wondering if there are other organizations like grassroots politics organizations, unions, maybe other things linked to influencing the vote around the country. And um, of course, this is uh, maybe a linked con uh, question, kind of related. Uh, you talk about the differences around the country of, you know, economic class voting for a different, uh, you know, candidate or party, and obviously regions as well linked to that as well. Um, I was just wondering if the propaganda um, was consumed in a different way between these regions and between the economic classes, and if these organisations had a thing, had like the media, for example, or trade unions or grassroots organizations had a part in that as well? Well, um, Brazil historically is not that uh, highly organized country, you know. We have nothing close to what Tocqueville was able to tell about democracy in America, about the association at grassroots level. And, you know, it was until very recently a uh, rural country, uh, uh, a country ruled by slave owners and lots of high, high figures of illiteracy until some 50 years ago. So it's, uh, it's not an, you can't think about Brazil and Brazilian electorate as a kind of an organized civil society. Uh, a first boost, on the, you have some union organization with some, uh, some propelling by communist parties since early, 20, early 20th century, but then after the war, the communist party was outlawed and the, the unions in Brazil was basically framed under uh, 
labor legislation that was enacted in late 30s, early 40s by Getulio Vargas that made himself a dictator. And in a kind of pretty much Bismarckian way, he just made up some labor legislation and the union organization under the labor ministry that was able to do. You know, people used to disqualify our experience on that ground is, is unfair because, you know, it may be uh, induced by top-down processes, but still, it's organization, and it becomes relevant in due time. And uh, during redemocratization, you have some kind of associational boom in late 70s, early 80s, during the last transition. And uh, for good or bad, uh, PT was the great benefactor and ripped up this boom. Was the, he, he, they were able to channel this effervescence uh, in votes. They were far more successful than any socialist or communist party before them were able to be. Uh, since uh, late 80s, they were challenging uh, for the presidency in realistic terms, in part because they were pretty heterodox. And it's not, PT is not, never was, a, it, it was very radical in, the, in its beginnings, but was never a disciplined uh, a communist party as they used to be. Uh, it was kind of chaotic programmatically and uh, in, in terms of, of action on the ground. And it is, it's a, a melting pot of many different groups that came together after the dictatorship. There was included lots of political prisoners and academics and youth and the unions led by Lula as the, the metal workers in Sao Paulo and the uh, Catholic Church. That's very atypical. <laughs> and it was very important in, in, in the grassroots efforts by PT. Because you have, you know, in late 70s, you had some that uh, left-leaning Catholicism in Latin America that was later pretty much disciplined by John Paul II and, and, and Joseph Ratzinger that became Benedict. Uh, Pope Benedict, they were the, the, the discipliners, <laughs> I don't know, uh, of this leftist Catholicism that was very widespread in Latin America in late 70s. But Pete was a benefactor of this, this uh, they used to call the, the ecclesial, uh, ecclesial communities, basis ecclesial communities that they had some kind of cells of political proselytism and religious proselytism all over again. So when Collor in 89 defeated Lula in his first bid for the presidency, Lula reached the, the second leg and Collor had to face petista opposition in the whole country at that point. It, it, it was very favored by the penetration of petismo uh, via uh, Catholic Church. So uh, Lula was never a kind of a ideologue, a, a socialist ideologue. So very, I used to, call to, my, to say to my colleagues, uh, academics, that you know, the, 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 the petista utopia is, is not really a proletarian or a socialist in any way. It kind of, uh, a petit bourgeoisie dream, you know. Lula, when won his his first election in 2002 and became president, he said very, very characteristically that if each Brazilian had three meals a day, he would have uh, fulfilled the, the the mission of his life. That's all. Uh, you know, the 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 petista utopia is a kind of. Um, Consumption for the masses. <laughs> it's not kind of the, the expropriation of, of the means of production of anything like that. 
It's just popular consumption. And so it's kind of a pro-market in many ways, too. So, uh, but uh, the relation, so, so our party organization is very feeble, and PT was able to have some grassroots organization via union and church. And, but uh, the other parties were always dependent on local bosses and no organization at the ground. So it's kind of an uh, unbalance, a not deeply rooted political uh, party system. And so they are not uh, traceable to media outlets as in Europe that you have, you know, the Democrat Christian newspaper and the new Democrat Christian news media and the socialist newspaper and news media in Spain or German or, or things like that. You have uh, media in Brazil, it's, it's a business entrepreneurship by people that are, with, had close ties with government, global organization uh, flowered under the military regime and has its political ties with establishment. It has no rival in this uh, associate that is traceable to, to, to parties, I think like that. So it's pretty much disconnected. So it's a, 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 a politically sensitive question inside the left in Brazil about what to do about media regulation and things like that. And if, if, if they should expropriate media in, in bring about new media outlets. This is an unsettled business. It's, in Brazil, it's pretty much monopolized uh, what used to be. And now we have internet and WhatsApp and we still have and robots and we don't have a clue realistically of what's really going on. <laughs> We're still learning to see what's going on. But under the, as I say, the Old Testament where TV news were giving the, the cards. Typically, you have one media source that is global network that is really relevant. Yeah, and each person, each group has that media. <laughs> Some, something someone has said to me before is that in Brazil, we had no idea these people existed, like the Bolsonaro fans. Like we just mm -hmm. kind of lived in our, in our bubble. We don't really come into communication with them or mm -hmm. it's, so maybe, you know, but under our electoral uh, system, you know, Bolsonaro could survive for 30 years at the, the lower chamber by just uh, cultivating a niche. You know, if, if a, a, a candidate for deputy have 1% or 2%, he's unbeatable because you have 2,000 candidates. So he cultivated the, the, the most extreme niche of the nostalgic of military regime. They exist, of course. Uh, yeah, there's and a monarchy movement in there. What? There's a small monarchy movement. I yes, think, like yes, very, very small. Yeah. Uh, I, I think what, what allowed it to go up to some 30% was the deterioration of the perception of what was going on political system from the new cycle and the, the Lava Jato and and yes, the economic the crisis the that was very mud. real. What? The showing of the rats in the mud and mm -hmm. you know, all of this discourse, media discourse being just it's dirty. Yes, and, and, and yes, I, I, I think um, the, 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 new, the new media resources in, on the internet, they favor uh, some disclosure of extreme heterodox uh, points of view. You know, you, you will find your, your soulmate some, some place in the Facebook or WhatsApp. And you discover people with many, you know, the, all the Trump strategy that just telling lies after lies and after lies and just repeating it. And you just have you know, everything is just relatively true. You know, some kind of cliche about uh, what's true or, or not. And you just... Any, any research with data rigorously tested is just put at the same level of any wild speculation. And nothing is sufficiently absurd for not having appeared in some 
source that seem to be respectable and it's going to so you have now a, a chaotic framing for public discourse that is you know 20 years ago when internet came to exist lots of hopes people had oh now everybody is media producer and we don't have to rely anymore on those great barons but you know we we we, we are discovering that it is worse <laughs> this way. You have no filter anymore. You have no reputations to be conserved anymore. You just, you and me, we're just uh, publishing, just like anyone else. The problem is how, how you amplify this. And some people learn how to do this. And uh, it, some people can discern between sources, this is reliable, this is not reliable, this is just crazy. But this is a, min a tiny fraction. Lots of people just can't spell. Nothing is absurd enough to not being credible. And uh, things that, is, that had been said in, in political campaigns recently are just insane. But, you know, uh, the, even, even if the, if the earth is flat or round, now it's under dispute. So it's kind of a metaphor for everything. And uh, in a, if the environment, if people have reasons to feel bitter about status quo, and they typically do have excellent <laughs> reasons to feel bitter about status quo, then there will be lots of absurds, being plausible absurds being said, being sold to them at the internet. And this is hard to tell. You see, when, when uh, uh, 30 years ago, when Collor defeated Lula uh, by three or four points, it was a very close uh, election. At that, in the last week, Collor made a, a bold decision that he, he would use and he did use against Lula the, a, 15, a then 15 year old daughter that Lula had outside marriage. And he used it on TV. Collor used this, recurred to this dirty trick of exposing a 15-year-old girl as an illegitimate daughter of his contender. It was a scandal. And, well, Collor may have won a few votes with that, may have lost other, but it was a bold decision he has to take. It was dirty. It was a... a, a uh, low uh, tactics, but it was dramatic. He had to make a decision. He had to live with the consequences of that decision for the rest of the campaign. He was attacked, Lula was attacked, things went bitter, but it was a decision he had to live with. At this point, those guys just use many decisions like that for targeted public, outside media. That's, uh, this girl, it, it's called Lurian. It's now a, a, a 50, 45 years old, mature woman, militant for the PT, and fervent supporter of his father, Lula. But um, at this point, we have dozens of Lurian in each elections. And no candidate respond for it. There's no drama with this. There's no uh, dozens of, of equally dirty tricks are used in campaigns, but each one of us is seeing a different campaign. Campaign isn't in WhatsApp. The campaign I see is different from the campaign you see that is different from the campaign that my aunt see or is different from the campaign that someone at Hinterland see. 
it's different from the campaign that went in the Nordisk. Nobody answers for anything. You see, you don't have one campaign anymore. You just have lots of different campaigns tailored for each one of us. We are not having a conversation. Each one of us is exposed to a different conversation. I don't know if democracy can truly cope with this. If this is the new normal, I don't know what will be of democracy in some 50 years from now. You see, this is very different. At this point, if Kolo was to have a decision about Lurian, if, Kolo, if a campaign like Kolo has an information like Kolo has about Lurian, he would not have to make a decision. He would not have to make a dramatic decision and respond for that. He would leak it for the internet, and he would never talk about it. He is, it would just be a smear campaign on the internet. I have nothing to do with this. You see, nobody's talking about anything, and everybody is hearing about everything. You see, and it's, it's very complicated, <laughs> and we, we still don't know how to deal with it. And last year here in Brazil, yes, it was, the feeling was that we were seeing different campaigns. You see. Um, and there was something the last question, here. please. Yeah. <laughs> then you have here. Mm -hmm. No, no, okay. yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, I have one question regarding the impact of the changes of the social structure in the patterns of voting. So, you mentioned there was this big transformation of, um, of how the electorate was voting for, uh, in this case, for, for the PT um, since the turn of the century and how it developed. And also, you mentioned the important issue of consumption. So, uh, since there was a huge transformation of the social structure of Brazilian society um, because a lot of people uh, st uh, stopped being extremely poor according to the category and became part of the new middle classes. Yeah. Uh, how? Not poor, but not extremely poor. <laughs> yeah, that, that's yeah. it. Mm -hmm. I, that, that's what I'm like mm -hmm. yes. talking about these categories. Uh, how do you think was the impact of this, uh, this immense change of the social structure also for the mobilization that we have seen since 2013 that became increasing and also um, and also f were followed the protests were followed by the impeachment protests and we saw this rise of also a lot of young supporters of bolsonaro and how how do you see this this relation between this transformation in a socio-economic sense with the political attitudes mm -hmm. of the population. Um, and I know this is a huge topic, but I would be interested, interested in the term you used, like in the Bolsonarization of society, more than the election of Bolsonaro as a figure who is representative of a lot of sentiments that are, were present and were being developed in this last period and suddenly appeared to, um, to have this peak with the election last year. That would be the first part. And the second part is also how, because we, we know that there was this disenchantment with the previous world government, which had uh, real factors regarding the economic mismanagement, for example, but w which other key elements do you see that were like real failures, and not only this sensationalist media coverage of uh, corruption scandals, which were previous or not just um, symptomatic of a specific government. So which failures do you see and are the most important for explaining the current situation? Um, and I'm also interested in the affective side because it is not all, always a logical or rational uh, hate or anger against, in this case, Petit, or what is seen as leftism or communism or, or the people who, who are the others. Uh, but you have a new configuration of how, how the social web is being articulated in, sen in the sense of how people relate to each other. Um, so I know these are difficult questions, and everybody's trying to figure out how it came to yeah. the 
uh, current moment, but I think it, it is also important to address it from this emotional and affective mm. side, which cannot be explained only by very rational mm. um, theories. I see. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, in, in pills, <laughs> short pills, are just uh, to share a few guesses. First, uh, relative deprivation is always important, eventually more than absolute deprivation. Uh, how you perform, how you fare relative to your expectations is far more relevant politically than how you fare. <laughs> Absolutely. Then uh, by 2013, things were improving for any length of time, but uh, the economy was starting to slow down and to, you know, some crash landing and some and there was lots of you know lots of effective policies of cash transferring not only the famous bolsa familia but raising the minimum wage and programs for familiar agriculture you know that made the, the extreme poor less poor and it was hugely relevant but uh, more demanding policies for poor sectors were not equally effective. For instance, uh, public transportation that was at the center of the, the beginning of the protests in 2013. So uh, at that point, the, the, the people in the suburbs and you know, the periphery of the capitals were not only glad or happy or grateful for having a bus, they like to have a, a good, reliable, safe, punctual, cheap bus. You see, and this is only fair. They deserve it. They earn it. And it's not, the point is, okay, I have some income that I didn't have. Now I have some jobs. We are at university, at colleges that our parents weren't. So my parents are very grateful and think that I am privileged. But I am at college and I demand equal conditions from my colleagues that are at college with me. I don't want to, to take three hours to take at home and at the college every day. By the same time as my college mates are having fun and studying. So, a a as you succeed in some points, you will be uh, facing an increasing demand to live up to your promise. And that's how it should be. But it's harder <laughs> to, to cope with this. Especially at that point when the commodity booms were not... 2013, Europe was in crisis, and the world was slowing down and the prices of the commodities was not as high as they were five years earlier. So Brazil is not in the same comfortable situation. And a small protest that was harshly crushed by police sparkled anger throughout the country. And it was a quake that never healed still. So we're, we're not sure of where it starts. It was from the right, from the left. It doesn't matter, you know. You just have to live with it. And at this point, uh, you have an anger that was, uh, since at the, in, the, in the coming months, the economic situation only got worse, then it was possible to, to create momentum against it. It wasn't a very unfortunate election. Well, I don't, I don't think that our political elites w lived at the height of their responsibility in 2014. They, were they treated each other very, very harshly. You know, they didn't respect the election and the process and the right of the process. So uh, it was a very, Dilma was, ve Dilma campaign was very, very harsh over Marina Silva. And ISU's campaign was disqualifying about Dilma. ISU told, 
I lost for a criminal organization and things like that. So 2014, the political elite from all the spectrum were not up to the situation. I, I do believe that. There's, if the political elite failed at some point, it was there. Uh, Pete, I, I, the, the, the most serious shortcoming of PT in power during its 13 years was to operating, treating the fiscal question by denial, especially after Antonio Palocci's fall. There was uh, the first uh, Lula's finance minister that was in charge to 2003 until to early 2006, uh, was some kind of a reformer, a kind of an adjustment, and uh, but then uh, any um, mid-term, long-term adjustment fell completely out of the radar. Dilma herself, herself was uh, disqualifying any concern about fiscal policy, and she just lowered the interest rates and uh, multiplied um, tax cuts in a pretty irresponsible way that compromised the fiscal uh, policy. And it, well, you know, when a leftist party just go out of the power with a fiscal situation deteriorating, it just falls uh, perfect to the character by his enemies, you know, those leftists, those guys just spend money irresponsibly and things like that. That was not the case, but yes, that was lots of tax cuts and a kind of denial, simple denial for any fiscal question in Brazil, especially during Dilma terms, but still under Lula's second term. And this just uh, put us in a trap that we are just... Uh, on the other side, this is, you know, this new media thing, we, we still have to learn to, to live with this. I, I do believe that it's going to make very hard to parties in the old fashioned way to live, to keep relevant. But I, I don't know how to make a democracy without strong parties. You know, a democracy substantively. Uh, you know, uh, the left used to be very um, suspicious about representative democracy, We're always receptive to di direct forms of action and things like that. But you think about policies. The typical leftist policy is full of intermediaries, full of uh, 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 um, mediators among, you know, you have to make some kind of neo-cooperative arrangement in Scandinavia with patrons and unions and parties, and you have to put organization. Uh, the, the, the main um, lever of uh, social democracy is typically a kind of a veto that is imposed by uh, a leftist party with union connections that just were able to, no, you're not going to do this your way, we are going to negotiate, they are forcing negotiation and cons mutual concessions. If the parties go weaker and the unions go weaker and we are all going to Facebook and, and WhatsApp, it, it seems uh, we, we have the feeling that of immediate influence, but we don't have veto power, you know? And, and we are, I do believe that we are the, the people that are able to play that game on the scale favored by this act, direct action of each one of us in our own uh, cell phones, uh, expressing ourselves in an unorganized way in politics, just favor those guys that are able to play the big game um, unimpeached by coalitions that have veto power, that I'm going to stop this factory. I'm going to put 500,000 people on the streets, and we're not going freeway. We're, we don't know how to do this anymore. 
we go to Facebook and we just curse Bolsonaro, you're, you idiot. And it takes on, <laughs> you know. And uh, uh, I do believe that we still, I, 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 I cannot see strong parties in the old way. Who of us has the patience to go to meeting after meeting and reunion after reunion and take all the bureaucratic course of participation and the relation of influence and, and cells of organization and grassroots work and this, you know, this is so boring and so sort of And we have a way to go to Twitter and just, you know, just curse them all. And the, you know, the show go on. And it's ineffective. Eventually, it's unpredictable. It's just put fire in, in Tunisia or Syria and things like that. But uh, it's not kind of a, we don't have, I, I think workers and poor people is losing leverage in the formal political system in the last few decades. And as parties go weaker and weaker, we have less and less leverage. So it's kind of, oh, they are both left and, and you know, the, the parties that are weakening are both leftists and rightists. Okay, but it's the left that depends on this organization, you know, for somehow try to exert some veto over decision process. So this is how I see things at this point. I think we have time for the last one, you know, not anymore. Okay. Thank you, Professor. So guys, we're going to have lunch now, okay? And then we come back. Yeah, so we come back to this uh, place, right? <laughs>